This is the Malayan jungle. Somewhere below are troops of British and Malayan units anxiously awaiting the arrival of supplies. Air Force freighters are the only means of bringing food and ammunition to the inaccessible outposts of the jungle fighters. There are no roads through the wild mountain country, and this operation against the communist terrorists is being fought under tough and difficult conditions. As always, supply dropping is accurate, and the parachuted bundles are soon collected. With stores replenished, the men set off from camp on another patrol through the hot, steaming jungle. Lurking in the forests is a relentless and cunning enemy, skilled in ambush and every trick of jungle fighting. An enemy that makes every movement, every sortie, a hazardous and tense operation. Meanwhile, back in the streets of Kuala Lumpur, the federal capital of Malaya, the school bus is quietly taking home the servicemen's children. Among them are several young New Zealanders. Homecoming this week is something special because Dad's at home on leave. After 13 weeks of the heat and tension of the jungle, Sergeant William of Palmerston North finds it wonderful to be with his family for a spell. He's one of the half dozen married members of the SAS squadron with their families here. Pleasant indeed it is to sit down to a table with linen and china and not have to worry about terrorists concealed in the treetops while you're eating a meal. Mrs. Dalziel has been learning Mahjong while her husband's away fighting. And now, with help from Chinese friends, her husband's going to learn. For Private Gray, the game's all right, but some young people think it's just a joke. When the Dalziels get back to Otrahonga, these peaceful interludes will be among their happiest memories of Malaya. Welcoming Indian friends to their home away from home are Sergeant and Mrs. Delves of Whanganui. For the time being, Sergeant Delves forgets the discomforts and dangers of active service. On these rare and brief social occasions, there are happier things to remember and talk about. Life in New Zealand is probably one of them. Mrs. Boswell plays for her little girl because Captain Daddy is going out. There's a mess due tonight, so all their wives are hoping the men will enjoy themselves. Also off to the mess is the squadron commander, Major Rennie of Titahi Bay. After prowling through the jungle, men of the SAS find their way easily round here. For the whole 120 of them, it'll soon be back to the bush again, where they'll be adding to their reputation as a crack paratroop squadron. Right now, it's a rest well earned. Jim Driver of Dunedin eats soup with no hands. He's demonstrating what's been named a distar for Bryant at the Wellington Return Servicemen's Club before His Excellency the Governor General and Lady Norrie. Some years ago, an attack of polio deprived Jim of the use of his arms. But thanks to this versatile machine, he can wield his cutlery with his feet. The inventor, Mr. A.W. Taff, MBE of Napier, changes a fork for a special cup holder. Jim's going to show how he takes a drink. The distinguished audience will believe it when they see it, but not before. The machine was supplied by the Disabled Servicemen's Re-Establishment League and Jim is one of the first civilians to benefit. The League held the demonstration to make their clients known to all whom it could help, and later their General Secretary, Mr. A. R. Johnson, checks up on its usefulness. Mr. Driver, uh, what benefits do you feel you have derived from the DISTAP appliance? Well, quite a number of benefits, really. The first of them is that I can feed myself with it. The second one is that I can use a typewriter. But do you type for any particular organizations? Yes, as a matter of fact, I type for several different organizations. The first one, the one I spend most time actually typing for, is the uh, Seaspray magazine. In the last 18 months or more, I've been the outright correspondent for their target district for that magazine. 
as well as that I'm a publicity officer of the Otago Power Mac Club and incorporated in that I handle the sports section of the Otago Daily Times and the speedboats. Oh, you get very, very busy with your typing, Mr. Driver. Uh, would you like to type uh, something for me? Yes, certainly. With this invention, the feet do all the hands work. In cases where artificial arms cannot help, it makes all the difference to living. It's the same the whole world over. Where there's a sailor, there's girls. This old salt is lifeboat captain C.W. Bowman, skipper since 1938 of New Zealand's one and only lifeboat at Sumner. 1898 saw a volunteer crew manning Sumner's first lifeboat. In her 30 years of service, this boat made 460 rescues. Today's volunteer crew of Sumner residents is made up from men in a variety of occupations. Here's the skipper manning the pumps. Joe Clements and David Craw keep in trim heaving sacks of coal around, whilst Jack Kerr gets his exercise drilling out house foundations. Motto of the Lifeboat Institution is Semper Paratus, always ready. Rule number one of Sumner Lifeboat, on alarm being given, each member of the crew shall repair with all possible speed to the boat shed. A practice alarm has sounded. Rule number one goes into operation. Work in hand is smartly downed and the crew repair. The present lifeboat, christened Rescue II, was built on the Isle of Wight in 1930 at a cost of £3,000, about half of which was raised by public subscription. She has a range of 120 miles, is self-writing, and automatic pumps can empty her in 30 seconds. over the bar, two men in a boat act as stooges for this practice rescue. Ship to shore radio reports progress as the small boat is taken in tow. A bird's eye view shows the boats heading into the smoother waters of the river mouth. This volunteer service, the only one of its kind in the country, has well and truly lived up to the motto, always prepare. In 58 years, the Sumner lifeboats have saved more than 700 lives. Thank you. 